Hello out there and welcome to this Rain Taxi virtual event. I'm Eric Lorber. I'm the director of Rain Taxi. If you're new to us, we are an organization that champions aesthetically adventurous literature. We're currently celebrating 25 years of service to the literary community and our 100th quarterly print issue just released uh, this, this quarter. Uh, if you can't find this lately in a bookstore, I know it's hard to get out to them these days. Uh, you can also order a copy on our website. Check that out after the show, perhaps. Uh, you can also become a member and uh, get them delivered right to your door every three months. For tonight, we are thrilled to be hosting this event with poets Nin Andrews and Denise Duhamel. Both poets explore the puzzle and the pleasure of being alive, the dazzle and the drama of our contemporary world. And they do it with verve and humor, but also don't be surprised if those moving moments sneak up on you. Nin Andrews is the author of several amazing books, including her latest with the unforgettable title, The Last Orgasm. She's also renowned as a practitioner of the prose poem, and I think that subject will come up tonight. Denise de Hamel is the author of many acclaimed volumes, and her latest is Second Story. This actually isn't out yet. Uh, it's gonna be a few weeks, but what is time anyway these days? You can still buy this book tonight, and as as you may see at the bottom of your screen, there is a buy books button. You can, uh, that'll take you over to our book selling partner, Majors and Quinn, and you can buy uh, books by Nin Andrews and Denise DeHamel, and frankly, anything you like there. When you support us by buying books, you, uh, it's a, it's, there's a lot of wins here because you support the authors, their publishers, the bookstore, us as the host, and you get these amazing books to read at home. So uh, please consider doing that. And uh, otherwise, enjoy tonight. We have a fun format arranged for you. Uh, Nin and Denise have agreed to have a kind of poetry volley. So they'll be sharing poems and conversation in a back and forth format. I can't wait to hear what they have to say. I'll be leaving the screen, but I'll come back later to moderate a short Q&A with the poets. So if you have questions tonight, by all means, pop them in our ask the question box at the bottom of your screen, and we'll get to as many of those as we can. Uh, for now, sit back, clap if you like, and enjoy. Here's Nin Andrews and Denise DeHamel. Thanks so much, um, Eric and Rain Taxi, for hosting us today. It's such an honor to be here with my friend uh, and fellow poetess, Denise DuHamel, whom I so admire and whom I see as such a kindred spirit. I sometimes feel as if I've always known her, as if I have been showing her my poems and reading hers for lifetimes. How to explain. I grew up on a farm without neighbors or TV, and I was lonely a lot, so I had imaginary friends. Some were characters in books or myths, others I made up. For example, I used to imagine that there was another girl in the mirror who did the same things I did, only in a different way, in a different place, or on a different plane. So if I was dreaming something, she was living it. If I was thinking something, she might be saying it, or vice versa. Sometimes we were identical, that's when we met in the mirror. But as soon as our backs were turned, we went our separate, if similar, ways. When I first met Denise Duhamel, I had this eerie feeling that she was that other girl. At least it seemed that we lived in parallel worlds. If I wrote the book of orgasms, she wrote the woman with two vaginas. If she wrote kinky, I wrote sleeping with Houdini. We had similar themes and obsessions. Yes, Nin, that was me in the mirror that you saw and you were in mine. Um, so much about writing poetry, I guess, for both of us. And I remember that loneliness as a child um, myself. And I remember writing um, in my diary that had a little key and locking it up, um, but also just wanting to share it with someone. And of course, I didn't. Um, and I was had no one really to show that poetry to. So I was writing bad poetry, of course, <laughs> um, but poetry nonetheless. And at the time, I had no idea it was poetry because I'd only read dead poets 
so like Frost or Dickinson. So I didn't even know poets were alive. So I just felt like this sort of freak. I don't know what I was, I didn't know what I was doing. Um, and then even when I started writing poetry in college, I was mostly reading the male professors um, poetry and then the, the male uh, books that they would assign. And I loved, I mean, I loved the oddballs. So I loved Bill Knott, I loved James Tate. Um, but even then I felt alone writing um, about femaleness and our trickster bodies and our sorrows and our woes. And then I found your book, The Book of Orgasms, which was your first book. And I still have my original with the black and white cover um, that lists on the back the genre as fiction. And I felt like we were destined to meet. I bought this book just hours before I met you in person. And it was at an AWP. I think it might have been my first AWP, actually. And um, I saw this book. I saw the cover. I saw the title. I was like, I must have this book. And I... and and I just knew I had to have it, and that was it. Yeah, I still remember our first meeting. It was at AWP in Georgia, back when AWP was this pleasant one hotel event. I don't even think we filled the whole hotel. Um, we were both presenting on a humor panel, the first of many humor panels that we've been on together. Right, and I remember too that I wasn't even supposed to be on that panel. Someone had gotten sick or fallen, you know, fallen sick, and I was asked at the last minute. Um, and I don't remember anything I said or if it had any value. But I remember looking at your badge, you know, those badges that you, ha you know, that you were wearing the lanyards, and thinking, "Oh my God, that's Nin!" And I have this book. I must meet her. I must have her sign it. And um, that it was fate. I just remember that you were brilliant, of course, and the audience laughed really hard. And I don't know what made me happier, that you were so fun and funny and articulate, or that I had at last found a poet I had a lot in common with. So um, now here we are, Denise, women of a certain <laughs> age, as my father would say, still following similar trajectories. Um, in our latest books, for example, we both have a lot of poems that I call Goodbye Eden poems, although in my case, I guess they're Goodbye Orgasm poems. Uh, poems about sad truths such as our ecological and political demise, as well as um, our mortality. Uh, but I don't want to suggest that we're completely alike. We're also quite different um, in that you write directly about current events and I tend to be more metaphorical. Um, and I really admire your ability uh, to write about things as they're happening. I don't know how you do it. Um, but I wanted to start off tonight. There are two poems I just really want to hear. Um, folkways and um, Howl. So uh, I was wondering if you could start the reading with Folkways. Yes, absolutely. Um, so Folkways is about, well, a lot of the book. So I wanted to just say to Eric, thank you. That's the first time I've seen the book in, well, not in real life, because I know we're on a screen, but I haven't seen it yet. I just saw a picture of the cover. So it was very exciting when, when um, Eric held it up. So the first book, um, the first poem in the book is called Folkways. And ever since the 70s, I have feared climate change. I knew it was coming. I, um, I actually remember writing to President Nixon to say, we have to get rid of aerosol cans. Because it was like, remember hairspray? And it was like the ozone layer. Yeah, and I thought, oh, okay, now there's no more like aerosol cans at work. Like, so I had this kind of hope that if I just kept um, yelling and screaming that things would change. But of course, that wasn't the case and that isn't the case. And then at some point, I guess I just thought of um, climate changes and you know global devastation as sort of this thing coming. I knew it was coming, but I, I didn't know how close it was. So anyway, a lot of my book is about that. So this poem um, is called Folkways, and here we go. Folkways. I see the sea getting closer. I read we'll soon run out of drinking water. I floss the steak out of my teeth. I should be a vegan. Even the teenager told me so. She said I had the right sandals and earrings. I step off the plane, look up my carbon footprint. Greenland is melting due in part to my recent Google search. All my dead iPhones, along with scraps of bologna and turkey bones, add to the landfill populated by vultures in some countries, child scavengers in others. I buy South American fruit and North American groceries. Sustainability is a hoax, the article says, but I recycle anyway, cycle instead of drive when I can. Emma evacuates Santa Barbara 
wildfire in her rearview mirror, a laptop covered in ash, and a few books in her trunk. I say goodbye to my furniture and clothes whenever I evacuate for yet another hurricane. Decide what to bring, what to leave behind. My friend's favorite joke, what is the population of Bombay? Wait a second, let me check my watch. When I was young and naive, I had a foster child from Bangladesh. This was before I knew how much the charity's CEO was making. I was an adjunct in New York City with three jobs, but knew I was rich by comparison. I could pretend I was a good person. My sanitized love and concern reflected in the drawings the child sent. I started to volunteer instead at the Catholic worker, ladling soup and oatmeal into plastic bowls. The homeless smelled like I would have smelled if I didn't have running water or a toothbrush or quarters for the laundromat. Eileen Miles slept outside their New York City apartment with the homeless, but was sure not to use any resources that displaced the displaced needed. Miles took their own food so that the truly needy could get first dibs on dumpster bagels. You have no, until you have no toilet paper, you can't imagine how precious it's, it is. No tampons or moisturizer or shampoo. I live in Florida now where a graying man makes his home on the beach. He is a war vet, my neighbors say, but I am not sure which war. There have been so many. He showers where others simply rinse off sand. He waited out Irma in a shelter while I drove away with friends. Now he sleeps near the restrooms in the park and shuffles down to the surf, takes his morning swim. When he catches me leaving him half a roasted chicken, he says thanks for the delivery. He says maybe his luck is changing. Maybe one day soon the ocean will come to him. And this next poem is called Howl. I saw the best minds of my generation, i.e. Fauci, Burks, undermined by Trump, doctors hungry for truth, dragging themselves through inane press conferences at five, trying to fix the press's anger. Angels with hip replacements and fashionable scarves holding up graphs, making predictions, scientific dynamos trying to break through to give us light who, in spite of political tatters and hollow men, sat up zooming in the virtual darkness of cold, hard facts, floating across cable news host desks, contemplating death rates, who bared their brains to the World Health Organization and saw Monday night riots, angels staggering in Lafayette Square, flashbangs illuminating, who passed by unimaginative reporters with radiant, cool eyes, pleading with Americans not to drink Speech, tragedy among the non-scholars of pseudoscience, who were expelled from news conferences by a crazy and obscene know-nothing on the whims of a numbskull, who cowered in green rooms undercut, retrieving their speeches from wastebaskets and listening to the terrible thump of Trump through the wall, who got their words twisted, regurgitated, returning to Joe Scarborough with a plan for nurse for keeping nursing home patients and prisoners safers, flattening the curve in New York, who urged the closing of hotels and theme parks, paradise, church, shopping malls with mannequins, torsos glowing night after night with dreams of capitalism, now a waking nightmare of alcohol wipes, cock and endless balls no longer welcome in gentlemen's clubs, strippers shuddering, clouds of debt, no spinning on poles, no dollars, Canadian or American, all the motionless world of highways with no cars. Peter Pan's playing solitaire on their iPads, plots and more plots dug up in cemeteries, drunken, safer at home moms and dads banging pans from windows and rooftops in honor of first responders who are busy at work, their kids home from school, storefronts boarded up, blinking traffic lights, ambulances, but not much else sun and moon and tree vibrations in the spring dusks of Minneapolis and Louisville and Buffalo. Until George Floyd, until the protests began, the best minds of the next generation chanting, demanding sanity from the worst King America, who is clearly out of his mind. So in that last poem, Howl, of course, I'm channeling Allen Ginsberg and so many of your poems in your new book, I'll hold it up again. <laughs> um, the last 
orgasm are written after poets, um, borrowing their cadence and in some cases whole lines and making them your own. Um, and then you're writing in a tradition perhaps of mystics and surrealists, but your voice is always unmistakably Nin. I'm thinking of your poem, Orgasm, um, the poem in which you channel Frank O'Hara to talk about the complexity of living in our current political climate. Um, would you read it, please? Uh, sure. Um, the complexity, I think, is, uh, well, it, it's kind of hard to, well, I think the poem will explain it, but um, the poem initially had, I'll just go on, the poem initially had Trump's name in it, but I, I couldn't stand seeing it in the book, so I changed it. Um, orgasm. My husband was in bed reading the news. When I bent to kiss him, he said, lie down, why don't you? And I did. You're still reading the news, I said. Yes, he said and absently patted my arm. What's happening, I asked. Bibi Netanyahu just won the election, he said. That's when I had to leave. I don't care for Bibi, neither does my husband. I felt so lonesome then, so bereft. I walked to the desk and began to type. Words undulated in slow waves through my mind. They did not tell the truth. They said, I live by the ocean in a city of dust and crows. I'm the most beautiful redhead alive. Today, wearing a green satin blouse, I stretch out beneath the palm trees to warm my nut brown thighs. I stopped writing. Outside, it was beginning to rain. I sipped wheat coffee and gave the dog a biscuit. I called the poem Orgasm, even if, even if, there was not a single orgasm in that dusty seaside town. I love that poem, so fabulous, fabulous. Um, another poem I was hoping you would read is, um, in white dress on a black carpet, you use Vallejo's black stone on a white stone as scaffolding. And Vallejo wrote prolifically across genres. And I see you pretty much doing the same. The first edition of the Book of Orgasms, which I keep talking about, <laughs> was classified as fiction. And your prose poems and lineated poems too make space for commentary about poetry and scholarship and big world events. Um, so would you please read us, White Dress on a Black Carpet? Um, sure, thanks. Uh, thanks, Denise. Um, so writing this poem, um, I was thinking of Vallejo. I'm, I'm, I totally am in love with Vallejo. Um, but I was also thinking of how even as you love something, even when it's painful and you know it's going to end badly, you keep love, you can keep loving it. That's the nature of love. Um, and um, I felt this way about our country to some extent. I used to love our country despite its uh, many flaws and horrific uh, history. But when Trump came into office, it became more and more painful to be an American. Um, anyhow, when I, was, when I was writing the poem, I was actually writing it as a love poem. Black dress on a white carpet. You will leave me in Toledo on a snowy day in winter a day I already remember. You will leave me in Toledo. I already see you stepping outside in your skimpy black dress, your tall boots. The wind lifts your hair. You don't look up or back. You are but an exclamation mark on a white page on a Sunday in winter in Toledo, Ohio. I know this because today is Sunday. The church bells are ringing. The faithful in their fur coats and hats, their hands buried deep in their pockets, are on their way to worship, even as I write these lines. And I feel not you, but the absence of you, like a pearly winter glow, even as I make love to you, even as I worship you, your lips, your thighs, your clavicle, your hip bones and long slender toes, even as you fall asleep beside me, as you call out my name in a dream, as your black dress sways on the wicker chair above the white carpet. And I see you as a dream in a black dress, an ache in my skin and deep in my bones. And suddenly I know you are leaving and I watch you leave. I have never felt so alone, so lost. I want to wake you. I want to tell you love will tie us in knots. Love will beat us with sticks. 
Love will say he did nothing to us. You know how love is, so full of lies. But it will be too late. It already is. You are already leaving me, stepping outside into the snow with no one but the sky as your witness, the winter birds, the trees, the wind. Thank you, Nin. Thanks. Um, speaking of things dying and disappearing, um, don't you think Trump pretty much killed our sex lives? <laughs> it was like it's so awful. And I remember talking to you, Nin, right before the 2016 election, and you had seen so many Trump lawn signs, and you were really fearful that he would be elected. And I was trying to comfort you, and I was like, no way. Half of the people who vote are women. Forget it. There's no way a woman would ever vote for grab him by the pussy Trump. He just, they just wouldn't. So I was completely wrong, obviously. Um, and I thought, I was still sure that Hillary would win, um, even though I too live in a red state. And I think one of the horrors really that Trump has, I mean, among the gazillion horrors, um, is that a lot of people are reliving like their sexual um, trauma or being involved with a sexual predator or having some sort of experience. And I love the way that you handled this in your book. Um, would you please read The Orgasm Fell in Love with Her Writing Professor? And the professor knew she needed help? Um, sure. OK, so those are thankfully short poems, mm -hmm. little snippets of horrible experiences. I think I'll, but still, I think I'll just read the second one in because I'm a little worried about time. I don't want to overdo it. So okay. um, yeah, short, short, painful poem. Um, the professor knew she needed help. So he kept her after class long after the other students had left. One night he told her the story of Persephone. Maybe he thought she was so ignorant she didn't know about the seasons or how the world is ruled by sleazy gods, that it's a wonder anything blooms. Then he took out a pomegranate, cut it open with a pocket knife and gave her a slug, lopsided grin. What are you doing, she asked, as seeds leaked onto her white, white skin. Uh, I'm thinking clearly, Denise. One thing we both, <laughs> one thing we both write about extensively is female sexuality. Um, I've always wanted to reclaim, or at least rewrite, or we can uh, recontextualize the topic, uh, take it back from the patriarchy, back from the pussy grabbing creeps uh, who are in power. Me too. Uh, me too. Me too. I was sick of even when I started writing. I was sick of it, even though there wasn't really a term for sexual harassment then. But I knew like what it was. Um, and I'm still sick of it. And I'm really sick of women being treated as objects rather than subjects. Um, so I don't know if this is the place to talk about it, um, but in my late teens, I was a, um, an anorexic suicidal mess. Um, I know that might sound like TMI, but I bring it up because it's not an unusual state of being for a young woman coming of age in our country today. Uh, there are lots of budding Sylvia Plasts out there uh, but lucky for me, um, one night when I was in the midst of a terrible depression, I had what I might call a mystical experience. It was as if my mind suddenly, it was a TV and it suddenly changed channels. Um, and I was happy, radiantly, inexplicably happy. Um, I didn't know what to do with myself as a happy person. I didn't, didn't know how to exist as a happy woman. Um, I felt so alive. My body felt electric, as Whitman would say. And I was hungry. I mean, hungry for everything. There was no limit to what I wanted. Uh, and the wanting itself felt magic. I love that. Um, I am still waiting for that mystical experience. <laughs> um, and I have struggled with weight my whole life. Um, also not an unusual state of being for a young woman coming of age in this country. And I recently read that a lot of menopausal and postmenopausal women return to their anorexia or bulimia or some kind of binging um, because it's a time, another time in our lives where we're ruled in a way by hormones, right? So our bodies are doing things out of our control and it just feels really foreign and, and scary. Um, and now with like plastic surgery and um, the Real Housewives, I'm thinking of that franchise. I mean, I live in Florida where I think we have the highest um, well, Brazil, I guess there's a city in Brazil that has higher 
plastic surgery than we do, but we have more than Los Angeles. And um, I think this pressure to stay like young looking and thin and what, you know, just goes on and on and on. Um, and yet I feel myself harshly judging those women too. I mean, it, it's like um, the self-hatred, I guess, that happens to women. So I feel like I'm always fighting that and your poems help right. me do that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is a little aside, but um, one of my friends is a dermatologist and she said that social media has just made her very wealthy. Um, all that face, you know, you, you don't realize how old you look until you stick the phone up to your face, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and she goes, there's a reason that you get your vision just declines a little bit as you age. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, anyway um, but you know, I grew up, um, I grew up showing dairy cattle and uh, the way that the judges talk about, um, you know, the heifer when you bleed it around the ring and you pose it for the judges, it's so much like the way men and women talk about girls and other women. Um, yeah. Uh, I don't know, but, you know, I guess, but here's the thing, it seems like self-rejection and self-loathing are the social norms. They're expected, uh, but to be happy as we are, uh, to step out of the show ring, um, where are the role models for that? Uh, even in spiritual life, asceticism is the norm, repressing desires, we admire that. Uh, we have the Virgin Mary as our uh, Christian role model. Um, but what if we have it all wrong? What if the body is sacred? Uh, and that's a question I've had in my mind since I started writing. Uh, when I, um, ever since I began writing my first book of orgasms, I remember the very first professor I had, uh, he just, he called me into his office and he said, men, you have got to stop writing about orgasms. <laughs> he said, it is completely not okay. And he just turned bright, bright red. Oh my God. I had a really similar experience and um, I wrote about menstruation. I had a poem about menstruation and I thought, okay, I'll bring it into workshop. I was feeling like this is a good poem. And I remember the teacher had, he had a cow, it was a guy with a cowboy hat and cowboy boots like up on the desk. And he said, I couldn't care less about this poem. That was it. Like, no, like your line breaks are bad, nothing. Just like, I couldn't care less. And then he just went on to somebody else. And um, this of course was way before I met you. Um, and that's why I needed your book so much and needed um, your friendship so much over the years. It was way before Eve Ensler wrote um, the vagina monologues and sex and orgasms were like taboo to us women writing about them, but we were, constantly um, appropriated such a weird, weird weird word, but like men would write about women's bodies all the time in a sort of objectifying way. But the, when we did, it was like, you freak, <laughs> what are you, what's wrong with you? Um, so anyway, um, I'm glad that you brought up the Virgin Mary who Mary Daly has said endured the most famous date rape of all time. Yeah. Right, when you uh, think, I know. Yeah. Um, do you ever think about um, all of the celebrated rapes in mythology and religion? I mean, in, in, um, well, in the myths, there's Persephone and Hades, there's Leda and Zeus um, as the swan, there's Cassandra and Ajax, the, lex the, uh, the lesser. Um, in the Bible, there's David and Bathsheba. Okay, we don't, we don't necessarily call, know what uh, Bathsheba thought about it, um, but what about um, also, what about Helen of Troy? You know, what did she think? Was it, did she have a choice? Mm -hmm. um, and I've always wondered, what do you make of the myth of Teresia, the blind seer who lived as both a man and a woman, and who settled that argument between Zeus and Hera about who has more pleasure in sex, the man or the woman? Uh, and Teresia answered, the woman has nine times more pleasure, or how did he put it? I love this. Of the 10 parts available, a man enjoys only one. Uh, and then Hera stuck him blind for his impiety. So even in Greek mythology, a woman wasn't allowed to tell the truth. Um, so wouldn't it be great if we had a new myth, a new Bible with heroines and protectors? That's why I invented Our Lady of the Orgasm um, in my books. She's a saint overseeing girls and women, sort of like Our Lady of Lords or Our Lady of Fatima, only she's real. Yes, Nin, you gave us the saint that we all needed 
And your poems too serve as a guardian of the female body and female experience, honoring the spiritual and otherworldliness of female sexuality. I keep thinking of Muriel Rekaiser's quote, what would happen if one woman told the truth about her life, the world would split open, end quote. And I think of the world splitting open because of your poems. Um, for example, you take on, I mean, there's nothing you won't take on, including our beloved Mary Oliver <laughs> in your book. So maybe it's time to read some truth-telling poems. Oh, uh, thanks, Denise. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I do take on Mary Oliver and her famous Wild Goose poem. Um, that poem that opens, you don't have to be good, and goes on to say that you just have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. I have heard that poem so many times. I've heard it in yoga class. I've heard it in churches. I've heard it on NPR. Um, and I'm I'm really sick of it. And I also uh, wish it were just as simple as Mary says. So uh, Mary suggests. So this is called What I Keep Telling Men. You don't have to be good. You don't have to get down on your knees or apologize or blame your ex. You don't have to bring your new lover Hallmark cards or chocolates, but in a occasional body of Chianti would be nice. You don't even have to let your soft animal body love his hard animal body more than once a week. He has you penciled in for Friday, 10 p.m., his place. He'll order pizza. You might want to pick the DVD. You don't have to listen when he tells you about his day again, his long and tiresome day with his teenage daughter, Brittany, who calls but hangs out when he offers advice or his secretary who has a habit of plucking out her eyebrows one by one as she tells him about her inability to lose weight, or his clients who want legal advice on bankruptcy law, how best to avoid responsibility for their company's toxic waste, and how he still dreams of becoming the head of his firm or a politician or a CEO. And you don't need to talk about your day either, how the sun slid across the sky how no words came to your mind or the blank page, and how empty you felt then. How you took a, took a nap on the lavender sheets he gave you for Christmas. Or how you walked the dogs at dusk and a flock of geese flew overhead, then landed in the tall grass by the path. You tried to chase them away, but they rushed at you, honking and hissing. And you thought all at once, how whoever you are, no matter how accomplished or sad, the world rushes back at you like these wild geese and shits all over the place. So good, so good. Geese are shitty birds and they have actually taken over the cemetery where my father's buried and they're honking, pooping, just like basically harassing the poor mourners that go there. So someone had to say this man and, and I'm glad I, that you did. Uh, so how about a truth telling poem of yours? I love uh, Wednesday, April 29th, 1992. Okay, thank you, thanks. So um, I discovered the beginning of this poem um, in a journal that was almost 30 years old. And here we go, Wednesday, April 29th, 1992. The first night of the Rodney King riots, my then boyfriend convinced me to stay home, though I wanted to go to the New Yorkian Poets Cafe, where there was a protest open mic. It could get violent, he said. Because I was somewhat self-actualized, I refrained from calling him a coward. Men, I thought, can be afraid too. I was confused as he seemed so much more political than I was. He could name all the American senators and battle dates that were smudges of scrambled time in my brain. He had lived through a coup in another country. He wasn't willing to join in demonstrations and earlier in the day predicted the looting that would happen in LA. I'm not blaming him, but blaming myself for not going alone, for all the times I've stayed quiet, tucked my neck deep in my collar. Though revolution is just around the corner, the guillotine and third estate. My boyfriend and I stayed in playing Scrabble, feasting on vanilla Sara Lee cake. I love that poem. It's so uh, Marie Antoinette, let them eat cake. Uh, and it's also a, a really nice contrast to the first poem you read, Folkways. Um, they both um, 
it, they both end with food and um in that in the first one you offer a homeless man a chicken so it shows this evolution it's beautiful um i was thinking maybe we could close with goodbye poems um after all we're both uh, looking back writing as mature and forgetful poets <laughs> as we enter the fourth stage of life i'm using the Jungian view of the stages of life the athlete the warrior the statesman the spiritual in other words we're in our swedish death cleaning stage uh, although now that I mention it, uh, I'm not sure how these stages apply to women. Well, I know when you when you um, told me about that a few days ago, I looked it up, and the analog for women's experience is horrifying: motherhood, career, old lady wisdom. And that's it. We only get three, apparently. There was nothing even about girls. So anyway, that's why the world needs your poems in. Okay, yours too. How about how about reading your old lady forgetting poem? Oh sure, yes. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> this is called Dear Memory. Dear Memory, what have you done with my keys? I blame you, though it's hard to cold a grudge these days because I usually don't remember why I was angry in the first place. I look at a person, sure she's done me wrong, though the inciting incidents are lost. Former students seem familiar, but their names disperse like cigarette smoke, blowing towards a stool where I once drank myself sick. Now I'm not even sure what city that bar was in, the welcoming pink neon letters, another cloud, as though I'm looking at tiny prints without my reading glasses. I was on a pink cloud when I first stopped drinking. In fact, I once looked up at the moon, weeping in gratitude. So there, I do recall something. I was walking across the Brooklyn Bridge in an ex's sweatpants, though I'm not sure any more of his name or if I ever gave those sweatpants back. I'm usually halfway through a movie on Netflix when I realize I've already seen it, probably in an old-fashioned freestanding theater, perhaps a matinee or a midnight screening, perhaps a popcorn bucket on my lap, that is, if I wasn't on some fad diet. Did I take my pain pill or not? I'm drinking water, but not sure I can detect that bad taste all the way back on my tongue. Maybe I've been drinking more water than I thought. Is it time to go to the gynecologist again? The office usually sends me a reminder postcard, but today I'm holding a letter from the breast center saying it's time again for my mammogram. I usually get a prescription from the gynecologist about a month beforehand. This is how it's been the last few years. I wonder if my doctor is retired or dead. I would call him, but I have forgotten his name. It begins with an S, and I think I remember the exit. I look through a stack of business cards I save for moments such as this, but no card for him. I go to take out the recycling just moments after I took out the recycling. I stand at the fridge, its door ajar, the cold light bulb, an idea for a poem which I've also forgotten. A sublime dream that woke me in the middle of the night. A sublime dream I was sure I'd never forget. Ah, here is my key ring, but this gold one with the big square head. What lock could it possibly open? I love that ending. <laughs> Thank you. It's, I mean, it's, it's great for the, I mean, obviously it works and on, and on the metaphorical level, it's, it's just, it's just fabulous. Thank Sorry. you. Uh, yeah. Um, so would you like to close with one of your goodbye poems? I realize we're going to just yes. end right at okay. okay. So um, okay. I was thinking like God. Okay. And I was struck uh, by how you obliquely bring in Mary Oliver again at the end. Yeah, just another little nit, you know, well. Go for it. Like God. One day the orgasms decide it's over, done, fini. They say they are suspending all services. They have been stepped on too often, looked down on from above, or worse, taken for granted, forgotten, abandoned? What happened to the days when we were all you wanted, thought of, counted, they ask among themselves as they put on their pants and hats, fasten their buttons and pack their bags? Of course, they have only a handful of belongings, most as light as tissue paper. But even as they slip out of doors and windows in the middle of the night, they are careful not to look back for fear they will burst into tears. After all, they studied you for so long. You are all they dream of and know. Like God, 
They love everything about you. Also, like God, they know when you ask, was I good? You don't want the real answer. Fabulous. Thank you, Nin. Thank you, Nin, um, for doing this. And thank you, Eric, for inviting us to read. Um, it was so much fun. Thanks. Oh, it is absolutely our pleasure. Thank you both for the extraordinary uh, reading and conversation and, and uh, all around uh, poetry circus in the best sense of the word. Um, <laughs> We, we do have time for a few questions, if that's okay, and uh, and uh, have uh, some really good ones. Of, uh, so I'm going to start out with uh, uh, a couple that are meant for you both, and uh, and if there's time, I have uh, a couple for each of you as well. Uh, but uh, you both uh, so beautifully, uh, and not unexpectedly at all, because you're renowned for being fearless poets of of femaleness, as you talked about. And um, uh, we have a terrific question from the audience here that as a, a woman and a poet, is there anything that is hard for you to write about? Is it difficult to uh, uh, bring this experience to bear? I mean, I think, do you wanna go first? No, no, yeah, so you go first. <laughs> I mean, I, I, it is difficult, but it's also, um, amazingly uh, freeing to write it down. So I just trick myself and I would suggest to um, the person who asked this question to just write it for your own, you know, write it for you and then picture the person, you know, like I can picture Nin, like I know Nin will get it. And then don't even worry about what's gonna happen later. Because I do think sometimes every once in a while, I feel so great that I get a poem published and then when it's published, I'm like, my God, oh my God, oh my God. And you know, no one, no one cares really, but you know, you feel like kind of vulnerable after you put yourself out there. But I I think it's totally worth it. It's worth doing for sure. Yeah, I totally agree. I think um, you know, I actually don't have trouble writing it, but there's that moment when you're gonna stand up and read it. Um, I remember actually, Denise, we were in New York once and I was said, you know, I have no trouble writing this book of orgasms, but how can I stand up and read it? And she said, oh, you just put on a little black dress and little pearls and you just stand up. There. <laughs> I did that because I remember, you know why? I, I remember saying that because I remember the first time I saw Sharon Olds, who's my idol, read. And I thought, I don't know what I thought she was going to look like, but her poems were like so... Um, sexual and like and empowering. And she just had like this, I don't know, it was very simple, like just concentrate on my poems. And I thought that was like really eye-opening. Yeah, yeah. But as far as actually writing them down, um, I don't I don't ever think of, I, I actually think, okay, there's two things that are going on. One is I don't think of the, the audience out there, the one that's kind of scary. Mm -hmm. I usually think of, of Denise or a friend, the poetry friendship. In fact, I was I debated about opening um, today's reading with that one of my favorite poems um, is the opening of that O'Hara poem to Ashbery, where he says, "I um, what does it go? It goes, uh, I um, I can't believe there's not another world where we will sit and read new poems to each other, mm -hmm. high on a mountain in the wind." Um, and he's imagining himself like those being in those Chinese poems, you know. But I do, I kind of imagine always that I'm writing to a poet friend. Mm -hmm. um, that, and I think that those are my primary readers. I'm, you know, poets, we are a, a little in circle here. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel pretty safe with poets. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I do too. I do too. It's wonderful. I, I love that both, both your answers really focused on that intimacy, that that's what, that, that's the project under the project, right? It's, uh, it's, it's the, yeah, beautiful. That actually makes me want to circle uh, to a question for you, Nin, because uh, the uh, sort of architecture of the last orgasm, and by the way, I don't want any of your other fans to get worried about that title. I was like, oh, no, I don't want Nin Andrews. <laughs> so the same. <laughs> right. I, I was like, Shara said that was her last tour, and then she had like three more. <laughs> right. Right. Exactly. Yes. No, we, you know, and I think we get mollified as as one of the poems contemplates what this title actually means. So, uh, <laughs> but 
the architecture of the book uh, is a lot of conversations and homages and responses to other poets, as we heard some tonight. Um, and what, yeah, how does that sort of, uh, I think our friends in the academy call it intertextuality, but how does that play into what you're doing, uh, you know, in the excavation of material? Um, so um, there are a couple things going on, but the, the secret of the book is it's, it's, it's put together backwards. I probably shouldn't tell people that because I kind of want them to read it and discover <laughs> But all the way past the, the notes and all the way to the very end of it is where the book really begins. Um, and, and, and yet it reads better in the other direction. And it, I, I always like a little surprise. So you don't really know that when you're, when you start off. Um, and so, um, and so some of it, so there were, there were two things going on. Um, a, a long time ago, I was, in um, David Lehman was trying to explain what postmodernism means. And I really didn't follow what he was saying. And he, he wrote a, a really sweet little book that um, a press in South Carolina, uh, John Lane put it out, um, Hub City did on postmodernism. It's a very sweet little tiny book that kind of ex that helped explain it, what I what didn't really follow in class. But when I was <laughs> trying to follow what he was saying, he was basically, I remember thinking and writing it and must have written it down. I don't think David would have said it in class or it would have woken us all up, but like an orgasm having an orgasm, like a world inside a world. <laughs> and so I kind of wondered like, how would you write, how would, <laughs> that, how would that be? You know, how could you possibly do that? A book inside a book inside a book. Um, and then, um, so uh, then I was actually in this cafe in, um, to the next poem, that was the last poem. So it's contemplating the idea could I write a postmodern book where, where there are books inside books inside books? Um, so then I was in this cafe in Berkeley one day, uh, visiting my son when he was a student there. Um, and this Asian, um, this, this beautiful young Asian girl came in uh, with this, that, like a river of black hair and she had um, a Vagina Day t-shirt on. And, um, and then, then a whole bunch of girls came in with their vagina day t-shirts on. And I, I was sort of wonder like, what would it be like to be able to, you know, what would the vagina do on its day? And at the same time, I started to remember um, this Ashbury, my instruction manual. Um, and I don't, I, I started to write, started to imagine that this, this was all, these girls were in his poem. So, you know, mm. um, and as I was, and so I started to write an, a, a poem about Ashbury, an, an after Ashbury poem. Mm -hmm. And then I thought, but it, it was sounding an awful lot like me. Even as I wrote it, I said, it sounds like me, right? It doesn't sound like Ashbury, you know? Why can't I be Ashbury? Anyway, so I thought, oh, that all of the, you know, there's so many poets that, that have just made my life worth living. Um, and so I want to honor them or to, to go deep in their work before and say thank you and how about putting little homage poems together a set of them in a book um oh. now you're going to see why i had to like trick the reader because you can see how weird my mind gets and it doesn't make sense <laughs> 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 so they're all orgasm poems all in gratitude to these famous poets anyway so and the gratitude increases because it's so pleasurable to to uh to to feel your you know how involved you are with with these uh, uh okay. precursors mm -hmm. um and uh denise i want to tell people that one of the uh truly astonishing things in this new book you didn't have a chance to touch on it tonight but uh is uh we get this massive 30 page poem in terza rima that is called terza irma uh and is uh, of course about uh, about hurricane irma mm -hmm. uh, and it really caused me to reflect because, you know, uh, eco poetry and, and you know, our, our, the necessity to, to think about climate change is certainly um, in the front of my mind. But I was really thinking how, wow, this is sort of bringing that discourse into your more personal discourse, a, a kind of tone that we don't associate maybe with um, eco activism. Um, and yeah, I just wondered if you'd talk about sort of bringing those things together. Well, I, yeah, so I had um, this 
well, you can see me behind me is my apartment, which was basically destroyed. I mean, it's all built back now, but um, during Irma, it was just, it was all, pretty much the walls were gone. It was really bad. And so I was keeping journals and, you know, anyways, it was a very long, horrible experience. And I thought I was going to do prose poems, actually. But then when I read them, I'm like, oh, this is just horrible. It was like, I'm so sad. Why is this happening? I mean, it was just like I, I was in a really bad place. So I was thinking like of Dante and his sort of hell, right? This fiery hell. And I was in this like watery hell. And I had just taught um, incendiary art by Patricia Smith. And she had this amazing Tritsurima in there. And I'd never written one before. And so I'm like, I'm just going to try like one day. And then I just kept going until it was, it could have been a hundred pages probably, but at some point I had to like go, and in six months, this will be this, you know, I had to stop it. Um, but it was, it took about a year to write. Um, so I really like all kinds of form. Um, and yeah, it was, it was, it was really an amazing thing to do. It was fun. It was really fun to do. Yeah. I mean, it was horrible to live through and then really fun and challenging to do. Yeah. Yeah. Writing, writing, one area in which writing and life diverge. Uh, correct. Correct. But, I mean, I really was, I, there are other poems in there. I had um, an uncle in the seventies. I really was like an environmental activist as a, you know, 12, like from 12 to 14. And I had an uncle who had a Vespa and he's like, there's going to be no more oil by blah, 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 like by the time you're 50. And I'm like, oh my God, well then we gotta stop using oil and why are we drilling it, you know? And, and then I guess as as I grew up and became, I, I don't know, it just kind of, I was always in the back of my mind, but then now, I mean, it's really here. Yeah, well, and what a rational response, right? Well, gee, we better stop, you know, misusing this resource. Yeah, yeah. By I the mean, way, uh, someone wanted to know, did you ever hear back from uh, Nixon or Nixon? Yes, yes. yes. I, have, I have the letter somewhere. It was oh. like, thank you for your concern about the environment and that the EPA was starting and they stopped aerosol cans. So I'm like, yeah. I'll write another letter. But that was the only letter that ever did anything, really. You stopped aerosol cans. Um, you And well, you, you know, when you're like in sixth grade, you're like, I don't yeah. know what the big deal is. Just write yeah. a letter. And then, of course, now... I write a million letters and no one, no one cares. <laughs> no one cares anymore. Well, I think uh, for our final question tonight, uh, we might choose uh, this one, which I think is a good one. Uh, and again, maybe circling back to, um, uh, you know, the fearlessness and the barrier breaking that you both are known for. Uh, what advice would you give to young women poets today who want to continue that project, who want to break barriers in art? I would say do it. And now, I mean, when, I, I mean, it, you always say like back in the day, you know, I've become like grandpa, you know, back in our day, we had to walk and put poems in the mailbox. You know, now you can just put them on your computer. But I mean, I really do think there are many like really great feminist, um, you know, so to speak and Calix and I know I'm forgetting a million, but the, I mean, there's so much really interesting um, people who will be interested in what you have to say which I didn't necessarily feel, except from Nixon. <laughs> you know, I mean, editors didn't like write back, but you know, with that kind of encouragement. But I mean, I think that um, there's stuff that, you know, like that the next generation is going through that Nin and I have not gone through. I mean, in some ways it's better and in some ways I'm sure it's a lot worse. So they can teach us as well as, I don't wanna say teach, but you know, like not that we're teaching them, but we can tell them what it was like and what it is like, and they can tell us what it's like. So I'm, I'm all for young poets just saying what they have to say. Yeah, yeah I just, just, just do it. I mean, just tell the truth. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I feel like so many, so many doors have been opened um, that it's, yeah, you just have to walk through. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not, and so many more have to be open too. I mean, it seems like we, we I had to be careful because, you know, one step back and then we get one step forward and two steps back. There's a, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of, a lot of yeah. backlash. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, the spirit of what you're saying is certainly ringing through. I want to thank you both. Uh, you have brought, uh, you, your work brings great joy to people and tonight your presence has brought great joy to people. And, um, I just want to thank you and, uh, and, I encourage all our viewers out there to 
keep reading your poems. Uh, keep writing them, please. Uh, Thank you. Also, uh, I hope you'll come back next week. We'll be talking with Peter Gizzi and Ocean Bong. And, um, uh, and we have lots of other exciting events too. Um, stay engaged, stay kind to each other, uh, and, uh, and we'll see you soon. Good night. Good night. Thanks, Good night. Thanks, Good night. Thanks, Thanks, Thank you. Thanks.